we we're talking about Six Sigma applied to energy data and what you, what you can do with the information you have regardless of how much detail you have. So hopefully this will give you some good ideas on what to do regardless of the situation you're dealing with. So I'm sure this is what most of your facilities look like in terms of energy data. You've got huge boards, dedicated resources looking for energy, and the numbers, giving out notifications, charts and graphs, real-time data on any level of detail you want. Is that everybody's current state for their companies? No? Oh. Just <laughs> more. Okay, so this is actually at the University of Iowa. They had built this up over the years and finally had some a dedicated area to kind of showcase this is what we like to be able to do and hone in on individual equipment. But most of us don't have this situation. We have a plethora of different situations in terms of the data that's available. So what do we do when it's not set up like this? And maybe that's our 10-year goal, but we're not likely, probably not going to have that kind of perfect situation. So I'm going to walk through a couple different ways of uh, getting some data to help you go down the right direction. And then uh, we'll talk about how that can be utilized to help get the teams started in the right direction and then lead to more advanced levels of detail. But uh, the idea is to give you ideas for gathering energy energy data that you can personally implement or share with your personnel and your company that can go off and do this. So like in, uh, at least in, in my background, a lot of times the data's not there or it's there but you really got to prod and really ask over and over again, can we get it this way? What about, is it in this database? Can I extract it out of there? And you have to just keep asking and asking until you actually get the right information out. So it's there, but it's, it's not known, people aren't always just willing to just give it to you. So, and if we don't cover something, uh, I'll try to leave some time at the end to, to talk about it. And real quick on Rockwell, um, we're just a, uh, Navigation Communication Display Product Company. So we go. We have GPS equipment. We have displays. We have um, a lot of the non non safety related stuff in aircraft. So it's all the information management piece of it. And that's military and commercial. About 50 50 is what our breakdown is. Headquartered out of um, Cedar Rapids and uh, quite a few sites in the. So real quick, just uh, we have a lean electronics program. That's what our um, process improvement methodology is. Um, started about 1998, we really started to take off and become like a corporate initiative. Uh, so we've been doing it for a long time, but we still, I think, we still feel like we're just getting started in a lot of ways. And we've, you know, incorporated a lot of new techniques like Six Sigma, change management, theory constraints. We try to incorporate those into our program. So Lean is really our umbrella across um, all those different techniques. And we utilize the Six Sigma tool set for our data analysis and statistics when we're addressing more of their complex problems after we've got some of that low hanging fruit that we found. And again, I'm going to mention that if, if you get some pushback that says, hey, we're trying to get some data, is it available? You're usually going to get the no answer, no, it's not there, we can't get that. And my, my philosophy is just to be very tenacious about that. It's just to say, what if we did try this? Hey, if they're filling out some forms here, is there some data on that form? Um, I think that information goes into a database. Can I just get a download of that information? And usually they're to get annoyed of all the questions and just say, here, just take this information, just leave me alone. Um, or they'll start to figure out, um, no, but we could do this. You know what, let me, let me try this report real quick. Let me see if I can get something. And a lot of times data kind of magically appears after a little persistence. So don't give up when you get told no or the data is not available because uh, sometimes it is. It just be, go through all the avenues at least as you can. Try different angles, you know. There's also some very good techniques about working with people that you want to employ too, so uh, don't be, be very 
nice about it and be very uh, cordial. So Rockwell had uh, put together their carbon footprint, and you can, as you can see, the majority of that comes from our electricity usage. So we started to look at ways that we could go after this. Uh, and from a facility standpoint, they're looking at a more of a top-down approach. So my last talk, I talked about a bottoms-up approach. This is more of the top-down. So how do we walk down to our uh, through our Pareto chart to find the biggest opportunities? So the, the facility we focus on, looking at all of our sites across the 60 locations. Actually, we had about data on about 33 of them. The other ones were probably very small, but it covered about 95 95 percent of our usage. This complex was by far the biggest one, and it was even close. And it's a 1.4 million square foot facility in Cedar Rapids. Uh, we, the problem was we could not get any data below this level of detail. So we could see the usage every five minutes, but it told you the usage of that whole facility every five minutes. So we said, well, where is that data coming from? What's the biggest breakdown from there? have the information below that level. So go find the opportunity in that square footage to reduce energy. And it's, you don't even know where to start. I mean, you can do some walk arounds, but it's going to take you a long time. So we kind of had an idea where some key equipment was that was probably a big driver, but it's really was just a guess. And without any baseline, it's going to be hard to show any improvement afterwards. So we had a lot of ideas, but uh, we wanted to make sure that this first effort was successful. So we wanted to be very um, structured about how we went after it. So here's that site. We have the different locations. Um, and this doesn't show everybody, but of our top 10 or 12. And, they, and you can see that this, this complex is by far the biggest, and electricity is a big driver there. So a reduction effort project around energy, electricity reduction on Sea Avenue is obviously the first project we went after. So we had that five-minute data. So the blue and the red were different meters. And we can combine them together to basically get a full picture. But it kind of spidered out into the facility. And so you couldn't say that one meter went to this half and this to the other. So all we could really see is just patterns across the whole site. And one of the first things we noticed was, here's the weekend. Here's the weekday. I would have expected a lot bigger jump. I would expect a lot bigger drop down to here when people aren't working, and I would expect a lot bigger deviation when they were working. And the fact that they were, you know, basically it said 60% of our usage was taking place when nobody was there. Okay, so that's that was one thing that kind of pointed us down one path. We said, all right, let's let's go at it a couple different angles to see if that's telling us the same story. So that, that was helpful, and it did give us some good information, but. Uh, still doesn't tell us where to start. So the next thing we talked about is, well, what is running most of the time at night? Well, we have chambers where we recycle product through for a day or two at a time. We have test equipment. We have personal computers. We have an HVAC system. We have emergency lighting and then just general lighting. We've got data servers, environmental labs that are doing testing. We've got plug load things like fans and personal items, heaters, space heaters, uh, parking lot lights, and alarm system. Those are the things that are on 24-7, or at least in non-working areas. Okay, so it kind of narrows down our list a little bit. So just a simple brainstorming was good. Pull in experts who understand the equipment, who work in there a while, and we've got a pretty good list. The other thing we want to do is, you know, my statistics background says I can't work completely off just the brainstorm list. I got to see some kind of data here. So I call it, call it sneaker net. I don't know if that's a term other companies have, but it means you basically put your shoes on and start walking around gathering data. Uh, it was used for a way we used to download test data. We'd take it out of a floppy disk and put it on another drive that was connected to a network. But this area, we had 40, I think it was 40 substations inside that building. And so uh, a couple times a, a week, we would take out the clipboard and start going around to each of those sites and writing down, okay, it's 2 o'clock on Tuesday, and the meter says 382 kilowatts. 
being pulled at right now. And then go to the next substation. And so we did that, and then we started to, after we did that a couple times, it was 40, and we realized some of them we couldn't get data on, it was analog, or that meter was busted, or, but we ended up figuring out, okay, here are a couple of meters that are pretty high each time we come by. So then we did a little bit more sampling on those because we think that's probably a little bit closer to what, where we're going to focus. So it took a while. We did it at odd times of the day, weekends, holidays. Um, we tried to get three or four samples per substation and different times of day, different shifts, and then try to categorize that up just to give us a ballpark that says we're in the right vicinity here. Not, not, you know, ideally, I'd love to have you know, constant monitoring on every single one of those, but we just aren't at that point yet. And then the other thing we looked at is how can we map out the substations to show which area of the, of the facility it, it encompasses. So if we find out that this is a, an area that's using a lot of energy, what's the map or the footprint that it covers from the electricity grid? We also, from that sampling of data, we were able to look at different things like vacation, weekends, the first shift working, second shift working, and then nobody working. And again, we're getting the same kind of thing here. Nobody's working versus second shift and first shift. Not a huge jump like you'd expect. Weekends uh, down, but uh, this would be like third shift during the week. Here would be the weekend when nobody's working. This would be a vacation, so there actually was some shutdown. So we can kind of see what's happening. But again, it tells the same story that the weekend or non-working time is consuming a lot of the energy. So we also try to break out based on those substations. What is what, what's the how do we name these stations in a more uh, appropriate term? So is it the chiller system? Is it uh, Building 109? Is it our data center? Is it our, uh, our, we had some estimates of our computer usage. So some of the stuff we kind of went the other way and said, we know we've got a thousand computers in the building. We know each of them holds a certain amount of kilowatts per hour. Um, we can kind of make a ballpark estimate of whether this is going to be a big chunk of the pie chart. And some of the things we realized, you know what, it's not. So we even had some ideas we threw in there, like what if we were to be able to shut off this equipment? If we had any detailed data, we could show, you know what, that's only a tenth of a percent. Is that, that's not really going to get us a big improvement there. So, and you can see that there's a lot of the data we have no idea, we still couldn't account for. So all we had is just a ballpark idea based on the sample. But we had enough information to kind of move forward to say, there is enough opportunity here that we can go after some of these big ones. We're going to make a dent somewhere. So we then the employee input. So we had some maintenance technicians. We had some people worked in different areas that we did have some good data on. Um, and we matched up our brainstorming with some of the data we captured. And uh, some of the same ideas came out with that. The one we looked at was the, our HVAC equipment. When we looked at the chillers and the motors, and then we kind of said, well, we know there's additional uh, usage coming from pumps that maybe spread out across all the data. Um, that, that's probably going to be a pretty good opportunity to go after it. It was also nice because we didn't have to engage as many people in that process because it's not a behavioral thing. It's something we could look at from a, 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 a management level or facility management perspective. So it would be less difficult to, um, to implement. And if we were to wait to finish out that pie chart, it would have been another year by the time we got really good data. And then all of a sudden, things change. And, well, that's outdated. When should you take that information? That's... So the key was we, we got enough data to know that we, were, we had an opportunity there, and we moved forward on that. So one of the other techniques we looked at was uh, regression looking at our, our, our data at a, at a site level based on the utility bills. So is anyone familiar with regression analysis? Is anyone not, who has not heard of that? Or? Well, real, real quickly, it's really trying to come up with a model based on certain factors that say, these factors contribute to your end result. And so if we're trying to model out energy usage, 
we look at different factors here. So an example I give is you're trying to model out the price of a house in your city or in your uh, neighborhood. So you're going to look at more than just the average price because that's going to not be a very good indicator of your house or your neighbor's house or the house you're looking to buy. So you're going to look at other factors like what? Crime rate, okay. What other things contribute to the price of the house? Location. Location, school district, okay. How about the house itself? What factors? Number of rooms, bathrooms, square footage, perfect, yep. And if you can't, you can come up with, you gather up that data to say this is the, the estimated price or the last sale price, and these are the factors of the house, and this is the neighborhood criteria. You can come up with a pretty good model. It's not going to be exact, but it's going to get you in the right ballpark. So uh, we can do the same thing on the energy side. And this is an example where we looked at, uh, you know, the idea is basically to look at our, our energy usage over time. We have monthly data that you, the same information you get at your home. And you can look at it and say the, the, the black line represents the actual usage. And through regression, you're able to come up with a red line that actually it's pretty darn close. Um, you know, ideally you're going to get to 100%, but 75% is pretty good. And it identifies some key factors that drive the energy usage. So what we did is we took that same approach through this facility and at a high level said, what's the monthly usage and what are the key factors that could drive that throughout the uh, month to month? And so there's some obvious stuff like uh, outside temperature, that's always probably going to be a driver, especially in a northern climate where the temperatures fluctuate quite a bit. Puerto Rico may not be as, as much of a driver because your temperature is a little more steady. Uh, we also looked at production output. We looked at how many hours were worked or how much overtime was, was being done. Um, number of days, work, working days in the month. That, that's going to drive if we had 23 working days versus 19. That's going to could change our energy usage. So when we looked at this, we also looked at employee count, how many people were working in the building, uh, power factor ratings, some of the data we looked at. Uh, well, we got that from the utility company. Peak demand, got that from the electricity company. Billing days, so how many days were actually charged towards the bill. And, um, we got up to 50% just by looking at outside temperature. So that's a pretty significant factor right there that says something with temperatures is driving our energy usage. And so from an um, analysis standpoint, we would say, well, how do we, what do we do about outside temperature? Um, obviously, we can't build a bubble around the facility and say we're going to be protected from any outside temperature going forward. But what, is it, what does that tell you when you see that the average temperature outside is a factor? What is that, what do you, what can you, how can you translate that into something that you can take action on in your facility? Insulation. So, so what happens to the building when its temperature goes up or when the temperature goes down? What, what, what happens to the process? So yeah, the insulation is going to be something you want to look at, for sure. What else? When it gets cold outside, what, what, what happens to your building? What, is, what, what mechanical functions kick in? The heater kicks on, start using up natural gas maybe, maybe electricity depending on your heat source. So your building starts to do something because of that temperature. And that's the thing we wanted to focus on is what happens because of the temperature. So it kind of took us back again to that HVAC equipment that says we can control maybe um, the things that affect, are affected by temperature and we should really be spending our time and focus on that stuff. So our air conditioning systems, are they up to date? Are they working properly? How, what is our heating system doing? Is that being maintained properly? Is it efficient? Is it outdated? Could it be replaced? Um, 
What we did is start to meter up some of the air handlers. So we ended up finding 120 some air handlers in this building. And each one probably is not performing perfectly the same. So it's trying to first catalog how many do we have, what's the status of these, was a, a first step. And we started, then we started getting into the sub-metering piece. Now we started to look at how can I get more detailed data at this point. And it's a lot easier to go sell, hey, I need a meter on this, a couple different air handlers for a, a couple days, than saying I need a big, huge, uh, fancy sub-metering system for the whole facility. So then once we kind of use some rough data to get us down in the right areas, then we can get a little more specific on the data itself. And we can plot that out, get some averages, look at the variability, uh, really try to understand what's it telling us, compare air handlers to each other, are they performing similar, are some of them uh, using a lot more energy than others. Uh, what we end up doing is figuring out that the, uh, that the air handlers were running all the time, and it was basically a, a decision made because it was easier to do it this way. But they just left it running all the time in case people came in and worked. And so it was easier to just do that than have to deal with the complaints or try to figure out each area and what the energy cost would be to you know, basically come up with certain working hours for each area. So I think that was the reason why I got decided to just run it that way. So, we said, well, we think that cost is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, based on this 12% usage. Um, and if we were able to go in and take out eight hours of that 24 hour day or 10 hours, what kind of cost savings would that be? And that was the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, right there, it gave us a really good idea that we're on the right track or something. So we ended up having some surveys sent out to employees. They said, what concerns do you have about if we went to a setback program where at, after a certain time of day, the uh, air conditioning would go off or the heating would go off and it would go, it would, it would not go out uh, past an uh, expanded range. I think we went to like 62 to 82. It would stay in that range for sure, but we're not going to keep it at 68 to 72 during these non-working traditional hours. What concerns do you have? And we sent out surveys, we got some feedback, and a lot of the concern was, I might want to come in on the weekend and I don't want to be sweating. I'm probably working for free, and I'm on a big project, I'm not getting paid overtime, and I'm not going to be uncomfortable too. So we ended up putting in these override buttons where they could press the button and it gives them two hours of the normal um, heating and cooling temperature for that time of year. And if they are there longer than two hours, they go press the button and they get two more hours. So and that was a good compromise, and what we found out was really no one was using the buttons. Uh, so I think it was more just alleviate some concerns about, I might need this, I might want to do this. But we gave the option to anticipating that we don't want to have the employee complaints like we have before either. So, so, so we thought this is a pretty good solution for uh, coming up with a good solution to save money but didn't impact our employees and their uh, work condition too. So there's uh, benefits, about $3,000 per air handler, but about $300,000 in annual electricity savings. And there's a calculator to kind of equate that to something more meaningful. So in summary, don't let any limitations get in the way of getting good data, but there's a lot of things you can do that are, uh, don't require a fancy database or don't use that as a way to not proceed forward. There's other ways to get around not having good data. So look at utility bills. See if there's any metering that your utility company provides that can help with this. Get employee input. Do the old speaker net going around and manually collecting up the data. Look at some regressional, regression techniques. And again, a lot of these were just kind of reiterating that we're on the right track because they were pointing us in the same direction. So we just didn't rely on one method, but we looked at a couple different and said, all three of these are pointing to off hours energy usage. Or, and then finally getting down to that sub meter level on specifics. So again, I want you to share this with your facility people, your es and group. And for you personally, I challenge you to look for ways to employ at least one of these techniques. 
whether it's on energy or any type of um, project you're working on where you're missing data and don't have the right information to uh, clearly solve the, the problem. Any questions? Near each um, area. So we probably put in, um, I'm trying to remember the exact count. Uh, I think there's about 40 because they, they tie back to like uh, the substations. So um, if you walk through that, that building, you'll, you'll see randomly throughout on the wall. But they have a nice little sign to kind of explain what they are. And then there was a change management piece to that that went around each area. There was an email that went out that said, your building has now been upgraded to this um, program where we can schedule the air handlers during this time of day. And you'll hear that it goes off at 7 o'clock. If you're here after that time, you can go press the button. You know, so there's a, there was a whole process they started setting up after that point to install it. And they actually purchased the override buttons years ago, and they just never actually implemented it. So they kind of, a lot of people had uh, the right idea on that. For some reason, didn't have the backing or the project support to get that. Any other questions or? Just to buy 